When people think of electrochemistry, they think of plating metals, batteries, and the electrolysis of water. These are all known applications of electrochemistry. But electrochemistry in conjunction with organic chemistry is very uncommon, also known as synthetic organic electrochemistry. We do see the use of light in organic chemistry, as I have demonstrated multiple times on my channel, but why never the use of electricity? While synthetic organic electrochemistry has a lot to offer, perceptions that electrochemistry is a black box, combined with a lack of intuitive and inexpensive standardized equipment, likely contributed to stagnation in interest within the synthetic organic community. This barrier to entry is magnified by the fact that many redox processes can already be accomplished using simple chemical reagents, even if they are less atom economic. So even if electrochemical means are more sustainable and economic, they are not strong enough driving forces for the adoption of these techniques. So instead, it is likely that the only way it will be adopted is if you first have standardized equipment and second, show new ways to forge bonds with higher levels of chemo and regioselectivity than their regular organic chemistry counterparts. And we are now at that point in time. With the existence of the Ica Electrosyn and, most notably, the research by the Baron Lab, we have a standardized platform to conduct synthetic organic electrochemistry and literature that we can follow. Which means, synthetic organic electrochemistry can finally start establishing itself. Of course, proper adoption by the chemical community takes many years. So this is only the beginning, and it is already promising. Let's look at an example. For the synthesis of the hormone progesterone, which is made from this precursor. To make this precursor, through regular organic synthetic methods, requires 5 steps. Multiple equivalents of vinyl iodide and alkyl lithiums are needed for each coupling. Protecting groups needed to be installed and removed. And overall that makes the efficiency poor and the synthesis more complicated. If we instead decide on synthesizing this precursor using synthetic organic electrochemistry, we can reduce the amount of steps to four and replace three of them with an easy electrochemical procedure, while one simple high yielding transformation is kept the same. We can already see with this simple comparison that electrochemistry can simplify many complex, inefficient or even dangerous syntheses. So to show how synthetic organic electrochemistry would work in practice, I will make a product that resembles a combination of a catecholamine, such as dopamine, and a phenylmorpholine drug, such as phenmetrazine. Though this specific product has not been researched for any medicinal purposes, it shows that common drug scaffolds can be used in this type of synthesis. This requires the coupling of the corresponding carboxylic acid and aryl halide. But before we can couple the carboxylic acid, we have to transform it into something that allows it to undergo a redox reaction. And this something is a redox active ester. Luckily, this is a fairly simple one-step procedure, which is done by esterification of the acid with anhydroxythalamide. So for this, I will use the acid 3,3,4-dimethoxyphenyl propanoic acid. Of that, I add 2 grams to a small flask. I then dissolve it all into 30 ml of anhydrous dichloromethane. On top of that, I add 1.55 grams of anhydroxythalamide. I spill some, but it's okay, and I just move on. Then as the catalyst, I add 116 mg of 4 dimethylaminopyridine, or DMAP for short. It reacts immediately to form a salt with the acid, and perhaps produces some intermediate products, causing it to turn yellow. I then attach a septum, and pierce it with two needles, one as an exit, and the other connected to a syringe with a nitrogen line. I let it blow nitrogen into the flask for a while, to remove all the air, since the reaction is a bit sensitive to oxygen. After a few minutes, it should be good, and I can now add the final reagent which is DIC, so I take up about 1.64 ml with a syringe and slowly inject it into the flask, with the nitrogen still flowing. The mixture gradually becomes darker and turns a transparent orange, and then starts turning lighter again and becoming more cloudy. After a few minutes of letting it stir, I remove both the needles and just let it stir for two more hours. In this reaction, the acid is esterified with anhydroxythalamide by consuming DIC and using DMAP as the catalyst. The way it works is that the acid is first deprotonated by the DMAP. This deprotonated acid then attacks the electron-deficient carbon of the carbodiamide, forcing a pair of carbon-nitrogen bond electrons to move onto the nitrogen. The nitrogen then quickly rips off the proton from the protonated DMAP, balancing its charge, and forming the following intermediate. This intermediate can undergo nucleophilic attack from DMAP, causing the DIC part of the molecule to be kicked off, along with the oxygen, forming a deprotonated alkyl urea intermediate. This intermediate can likely immediately deprotonate another molecule somewhere, but it can also be done as if it were to stay around as a counter ion. The DMAP coupled intermediate can move around some of its bonds, explained with two resonance structures, essentially moving the positive charge from one nitrogen to the other. The second structure can be used to draw how it undergoes nucleophilic attack from anhydroxythalamide. The hydroxyl oxygen 
attacks the carbonyl, which causes the carbon-nitrogen bond electrons to move into the ring, moving one bond to the next position and causing the other nitrogen to pick up one pair of bond electrons from the carbon-nitrogen double bond to restore the DMAP. The resulting intermediate has a remaining proton, which is taken up by the counter ion to form the final product at 1,3 diisopropyl urea. After two hours, where the reaction should be finished, it has become white and cloudy. I then set it in a heating block and remove the septum. I attach a short path distillation apparatus and heat the flask to distill off all of the solvent. When pretty much all of the solvent is gone, a yellow residue is left behind. I try to dry it out completely by pulling a vacuum, but it is really snotty and just explodes around. Since I will have to do column chromatography anyway, I will just redissolve it in some DCM. I then add a good amount of sea light, aka diatomaceous earth, which will lightly hold onto all the stuff and make it an easily handleable powder. The flask is a little bit too full now to continue, so I will move it all to a bigger flask. I wash it out and down with more solvent and add another scoop of sea light. I then set it up for distillation again to remove all the solvent and get a dry powder. When it looks dry, I remove the short path and attach a gas adapter instead to pull a vacuum directly so that it dries out even more. When that's done, all the solid comes loose easily and I am left with a powder that contains the product. I also ran a TLC on the product compared to the starting material, which will show the compounds that are present with a spot on the plate. We see that the starting material doesn't show up in the product, which means that it is completely consumed. Whatever stays behind at the start of the product is just some polar impurity or anhydroxythalamide, which I forgot to check, but it doesn't matter. We then also see a perfect spot of the product, which aligns with the literature. There might also be some non-polar impurities that are in the solvent front, but I can't tell, since it will pretty much always stain the whole solvent front anyway. Either way, the TLC is basically a 2D column, and it can be used to know which compound comes off the column first. Now to start the column, I set up my smart rack and slide the column into the holders. These large column holders were custom printed for me, since the columns I use have a large diameter, which means that these aren't available in the standard selection. But since Better Basics uses a special 3D printing technique, they can custom print pretty much anything on request. Anyhow, I've weighed out about 100 grams of silica gel and pour it directly into the column. I then pass heptane through it several times to remove the air and make sure that the silica is packed down. When that's done, I put a layer of sand on top to protect the silica. I then run the solvent into the sand and I can now add my sea light that contains the product. So I just pour it all on top and then add some more heptane and tap the column to flatten it out. On top of that, I add another layer of sand. I have run the solvent down into the sand one more time and then added more heptane on top. I then run the column normally by passing heptane through it and applying pressure on top with the exhaust of a vacuum pump while gradually increasing the ethyl acetate concentration from 0 to 30%. The column will separate the components based on their polarity. Since silica gel is polar and the solvent is non-polar, it will carry off non-polar compounds first, since they are essentially repelled by the silica. We see that the orange stuff stays at the top, which is a polar impurity. When we increase the concentration of the polar solvent, in this case ethyl acetate, it will start carrying polar compounds through the column. The higher the ethyl acetate concentration, the faster the polar compounds will move through. In the end, this results in compounds coming off the column separately, and so we can collect them separately as well, to get a pure compound. Towards the end, the column was almost completely yellow. I think it's because the product isn't very soluble in the solvent, messing up the separation. But when I increased the concentration of ethyl acetate to 50%, it seemed to all move through better. Because of this, the separation might not be the most optimal. For this column, I first followed what was said in literature, but I think you can just start out with using 50% ethyl acetate and not do a gradient. Anyhow, I have collected all the solvent that should contain a product in this flask, and I immediately distill off all of the solvent. After only a bit of the solvent has been distilled over, we see that it becomes cloudy from a precipitating solid, which to me confirms that the product isn't very soluble in the solvent, which makes the separation on the column a lot worse. When all of the solvent is gone, a slightly yellow solid is left behind. Now, it's not so easy to just scrape it all out. So I dissolve it in a tiny amount of acetone. I then move it to a crystallizing dish. I wash it out with more acetone and then start heating the dish to evaporate it all off. I don't want to potentially ruin the product by melting it in the air for too long. So when it seemed like all of the acetone had evaporated off, I moved it to the freezer to solidify the product again. Afterward, it looked like mold and it seemed that there was still some acetone in there, causing some parts to be sticky. So I lightly heated it again causing the acetone to evaporate 
and leaving behind the product as a dry solid. I then scrape it all off and I am left with 2.57 grams of what should be the product. If it's pure, that would mean the yield is 75%, which is higher than the literature, but it probably isn't. Though having a bit higher yield isn't too suspicious, since it seems that the solvent used for the column in the literature wasn't the best for this compound, and I did modify it a bit. Either way, it isn't a huge problem if this product isn't completely pure, since the next reaction will work regardless. Also, the purification doesn't have to be done. With the modification to the reaction solvent, the reaction mixture can instantly be forwarded to the electrochemical reaction without isolating the product. Anyhow, now that the redox active ester has been made, I can start the electrochemical reaction. For that, I will use a device from ICA called the Electrazin, which provides an easy and standardized platform to conduct electrochemistry. Though, this reaction can also be performed with other means that supply the right current and use the same type of electrodes. So I have set up the Electrazin base, and on top of that, I put the included attachment, to which we can connect the vial with the electrodes. The vial with the electrodes looks like this, and the top screw cap is an opening to the vial, which I will remove, since this reaction can be performed open in air. The cap to which the electrodes are attached can be screwed off as well, and I have to replace the standard graphite electrodes to the ones I will need for this specific reaction. They just pull out of the top easily. The electrodes I will be using are a magnesium sacrificial anode and a reticulated vitreous carbon cathode, which is basically just foamy glassy carbon. It's quite porous and also a little bit fragile, and the magnesium is just a metal stick. These electrodes are from ICA, but you can also attach your own into the clamps, if they are cut to the right size. So I click in both electrodes like this, and I set the cap with the electrodes on the side for a second. I then set up the experiment inside the electrodes in, to make sure that it is ready. To set it up, I just follow the guide in the literature, since I have never used it before. But there is also a guide in the booklet. First, I go to New Experiments, and then select Constant Current, since that is what the literature requires. I use the same value as them, which is 12 milliamps. I'm not using a reference electrode, so I select No. I then select the total charge that should be supplied by the device, which for electrochemistry is measured in Faraday per mole. First, I select the amount of millimoles of substrate that I am using, which is 1.9. I then use the same value as in the literature for the electrical charge which is 3.5 Faraday per mole. This means that the device will supply 3.5 mole electrons for each mole of substrate. I then select no for alternating polarity since it is not necessary and I don't save the experiment. So that was it, now it can be started. But first, I have to prepare the reaction mixture in the vial. So I set up the vial and the stir bar that comes with the device and add in 700 milligrams of the redox active ester I just made. Then as the second reactant, I add 825 milligrams of 4 4-iodophenyl morpholine, which can just be bought from a chemical supplier. Then the two reagents that allow the electrons to transfer to the substrate. So first, 59 mg of the ligand 2,2' bipyridine, and then 90 mg of the salt nickel 2 chloride hexahydrate. As a solvent, I add in 9 mL of N-methylperolidone, or NMP for short. I then take the vial to a normal stir plate. I let it stir until it pretty much all dissolves. Since I hate working with mega small amounts, I am doing it on a larger scale and more concentrated than the literature, so it might not fully dissolve, but we'll see how it turns out. Then when it looks like nothing more dissolves, I add in 161 mg of silver nitrate as the final reagent, and the reaction should be started ASAP after the addition, otherwise the yield will be reduced. So I take the vial and then screw on the cap with the electrodes. It magnetically attaches to the pins in the back, and I press start. It then starts stirring and supplying current. It tells you how much time it takes for it to supply the 3.5 Faraday per mole, and for this amount, it's about 12 hours. So I just leave it to react overnight. What happens in this reaction is a decarboxylative aerylation through silver nickel electrocatalysis. This produces the coupled product and carbon dioxide. Magnesium ions are let off by the sacrificial anode that produces magnesium thalamide, magnesium iodide, and magnesium nitrate, while the silver nitrate is reduced to silver nanoparticles. To know how it works, we first have to establish a few things. The first thing is that 2,2' pyridine and nickel-2 chloride form a complex that can essentially transfer electrons through the nickel center. The second thing is that redox active esters are, well, redox active, and so can be reduced at the cathode to form a carbon radical and a thalamide anion and carbon dioxide. The last thing 
is that silver nanoparticles are deposited on the cathode and serve a variety of purposes. It effectively blocks the nickel catalyst from adsorption to the cathode surface, slowing down its decomposition. It lowers the overpotential to a degree at which the catalyst is a lot less likely to decompose. It also slows the redox active esters from reaching the cathode surface, lowering the reaction rate and preventing a large excess of radicals. And lastly, the lower overpotential also prevents a catalytic intermediate from being reduced and potentially getting destroyed. Note that this reaction barely works if no silver nitrate is added, which means that its purpose is very important in preventing catalyst destruction and normalizing the reaction rate. Having established this, we can look at the first thing that happens, which is the formation of the silver nanoparticles, which follows this set of reactions. First, silver nitrate reacts with nickel chloride to form silver chloride and nickel nitrate. The magnesium sacrificial anode gives up the electrons and is oxidized to magnesium 2 plus, while at the cathode, silver chloride is reduced to silver. The remaining chloride and magnesium ions will then form magnesium chloride. Magnesium chloride then reacts with nickel nitrate to form magnesium nitrate and nickel chloride. So after all the silver has been reduced, all nickel 2 chloride is restored and can serve in the next reactions. To understand the full reaction, we start at the nickel 2 chloride bipyridine complex, which is reduced at the cathode to form a nickel 1 plus complex and loses its chloride ion. This intermediate is said to react with the aryl halide, forming a nickel 3 plus complex. Then, through comproportionation, this complex is reduced to a nickel 2 plus complex, meaning it just gained an electron from a nickel complex that is in a 1 plus oxidation state, such as from the first or last product in the cycle, turning both into a 2 plus complex. This new 2 plus complex then reacts with a carbon radical, forming an intermediate 3 plus complex that contains both the pieces we want to link together. And the nickel will do that for us, since it will take up a pair of nickel carbon bond electrons while linking the two pieces together giving us the final product and another nickel 1 plus complex, like at the start. And to complete the cycle, we can say that the electron giving up in a comproportionation step is lost here, restoring the bipyridine nickel 2 complex. Now we know how it's supposed to work. Let's see if it did work. When I return, the program is finished and it is now a cloudy brown suspension. So I turn off the device and remove the vial with the electrodes. I move all of the contents to a separatory funnel and wash the vial and electrodes with ethyl acetate and add that to the sap funnel as well. I then add a saturated solution of sodium bicarbonate to destroy any acid and make the nickel salt insoluble. I wash out the vial one more time with ethyl acetate and then add a large amount of ethyl acetate on top. When sitting for a second, the orange color quickly turned yellow. I then shake the funnel to better extract the product into the ethyl acetate and fish out the stir bar that I accidentally dropped in. I then separate the layers and return the aqueous phase. And I extract it two more times with ethyl acetate. I then take the combined ethyl acetate extracts. And to take out most of the trash, I wash it twice with water. And then once with a saturated salt water solution. I put the washed extract in a beaker and add some sodium sulfate, which will absorb remaining droplets of water. I then set up a new flask in a heating block and add a stir bar. I then filter the dried extract through some cotton into the flask. I also wash it down with a bit more ethyl acetate. I then attach a funnel and like the first synthesis, I add some sea light to the solution to get a powder that is easily handled. I then distill off all of the solvent and I am left with a dry powder that contains the product. The powder comes loose easily and I just scrape it with a spatula to get it all down. Like earlier, I will do column chromatography. This time, I have weighed out about 80 grams of silica gel and mix it directly with 2 thirds heptane and 1 third ethyl acetate. I pour the slurry into the column and run a bunch more of the solvent through to pack it down tightly. Like before, I add a layer of sand, then the sealite that contains the product, and then another layer of sand. The TLC of this product shows that the redox active ester has completely disappeared and the aryl halide that was in excess is unsurprisingly still present. Besides that, we see two new spots that are very close together, which makes them difficult to separate. The reddish spot is an impurity, and the blue spot is the desired product. The TLC doesn't tell you how much of each compound is present. Some compounds stain extremely strongly, even if it's like 1% of the total. If we assume that this is also the result the literature got, this impurity should be insignificant, and so it doesn't matter if it ends up with our product. Anyhow, I just ran the column normally, and then combined all of the solvent that should contain the product and I just distill it all off again. 
When it's all gone, a yellowish solid is left behind. I can't get it out like this, again. So I add some diethyl ether to dissolve the product and move it to a crystallizing dish. I then start heating it lightly and again, try not to heat the remaining solid too much. I blow in it to make it go faster and quickly it all evaporates and leaves behind the product as a solid residue. I scrape it all off and I am left with 314 milligrams of the product 4,4,3,4-dimethoxyphenethyl phenylmorpholine. This is a yield of 50%, which is somewhat lower than the 84% from literature. But I did change the scale and increase the concentration, so that might be why. Either way, I can confirm that the literature on this part is reproducible. And to be fair, this comes from a respected research group, so there was no doubt. Organic electrochemistry is quite uncommon to come across, and not really something you would find in pretty much any synthesis. It is still a scarcely researched subject, but now with increased standardization, like with the electrocin, it allows for easy replication and research into new transformations. So in the future, we will probably see electrochemistry being more common in organic synthesis, since it is so simple to set up and allows you to skip many steps, and a lot of the time having a better yield. And everyone wants that. Anyhow, that was it. Thanks to Aika for providing the electrocin, and thank you for watching.